I'm going to introduce you to your host for today. We have Reverend Dr. Don Eisenhower, who is a master certified coach accredited by the International Coaching Federation. Don is the founder and president of Coaching at End of Life LLC, and the link to his website is there as well. We'll also share that with you in the chat. Um, and Coaching at End of Life LLC provides life and end of life training, resources, and coach certification. In addition to uh, doing life and end of life coaching, Don served for 15 years as a pastor and 19 years as a hospice chaplain and bereavement coordinator for two hospices in Pennsylvania, where he and his wife live. Now, the association has had the opportunity to um, see Don in, at work in action and helping others and um, really thrilled to be able to offer you an opportunity to connect with him. So with that, I'm going to turn today's talk over to Don. Please ask questions as we go. We want this to be um, your time to help answer questions you may have. So um, pop those in the Q&A and at the end, we'll make sure we save some time for a conversation. Thank you, Don. Over to you. Thank you so much, Deanna. Welcome. It is an amazing privilege to be here with all of you. You know, the more that I learn about the Histiocytosis Association, the more that I'm excited to be part of this community. One thing that I know you all have in common today is that you or someone you love is affected by Histio. I love the vision of this association a world free of histio disorders. Isn't that great? I am there with you on that, a world free of histio disorders. But until that is accomplished, I know there's something else that you all have in common, okay? You all have in common that you've been affected by histio. But another thing you have in common today is that you are all experiencing grief. Whether you're a histio warrior, or you're a family member or friend, or you're one who has had a loved one who's died as a result of histio, you can't help but experience grief. Grief is a normal response whenever we experience loss. So as I said, whether you're a histio warrior, whether you're a family member or friend, whether you're one who has a loved one who's died, you have experienced loss. And for most of you, you're continuing to experience loss. And therefore, you can't help but experience grief. And yet, even though that is such a normal occurrence and something that we all experience, you know, the fact is we don't talk about grief very much. As a matter of fact, for most people, grief is a taboo subject. We don't want to talk about it and we don't want other people to talk about it. So what do we do instead? What most people do is they stick their head in the sand when it comes to the topic of grief and loss. They're like the ostrich. No, I don't want to hear it. But you know what, friends, that is not helpful. The only helpful response to grief is to face it. It's to talk about it. It's to learn how to find our path through it. As Deanna just shared is the title of this webinar, um, as it states. Find our path through grief. It's kind of like this tunnel. Take a look at this tunnel. Would you like to enter into this tunnel? My sense is most of us would not like to walk into that tunnel. It's dark. It's scary. <laughs> um, there might be some other critters that are in there, right? And even once you're traveling through it, you see a light coming. You don't know. Is it the light at the end of the tunnel? Or is it a train that's coming toward you? So... Oh, if we want to get to the other side of the mountain, how about we just go over it instead? Oh, take a look at that. You really can't go over it. Or, or what if we go around it? Can't go around it. Could we go under it? Nope, can't go under it either. The only way to get through the tunnel is to go through it. The only way to go through the grief and to make it through the grief experience when we go through loss 
which is very much a part of the Histio Association, is for us to go through it. And that's why today, rather than putting our heads into the sand, we're going to face the topic of grief. We're going to talk about it openly here. And what I'd like to share with you in just the short time we have together are eight principles for finding our path through loss. Because of the short time that we have, we're only going to be able to touch on these principles. We're not going to be able to go really in depth, but they're taken from this book that I wrote called Coach Yourself Through Grief. So the office has a copy of that. You can get a copy of it if you are interested in reading more about these principles that we're going to share today. Okay. So let's jump right in. Principle number one is this. Find a safe place. I say on the screen, because of the culture in which we live, most people don't understand the journey of grief. Have you found that to be true? When you try and talk about what you're experiencing as a result of your loss, again, and that loss comes in many different ways. It might be getting a diagnosis. It might be a friend having a diagnosis. It might be a loved one who dies as a result of it. But if you try to share with people what you're feeling and what you're experiencing, you ever notice most don't want to hear it? They tell you, oh, come on, you just need to focus on positive things. Or they'll say, it's been three months. It's been six months. Aren't you over it yet? They are not very safe places. And so one of the first things we need to do is to find a really safe place or safe people where we can be honest and share what we're experiencing. And you know, when you experience grief, you typically experience a whole wide range of normal emotions. I want to share a graphic with you. A graphic that I had permission from H. Norman Wright to include. This is his graphic. It's entitled A Tangled Ball of Emotions. Do you see all the emotions that are listed here? These are all normal emotions when we experience grief, when we go through a loss. Take a look at them. There's anxiety, confusion, sorrow, dismay, apathy, anguish, disappointment, resentment, rage, guilt, distrust, helplessness, vindictiveness, so many more. Right in the center is denial. And that's there in the center because that's the first emotion that most of us experience when we go through loss, the sense of shock. Or disbelief, I can't believe that's really true, or no, it's not, it can't, couldn't have happened, that can't be my diagnosis, and there's a time of denial. But then all these other emotions are often present, and do you notice these emotions aren't very nice and orderly, are they? I mean, they're all tangled up together, why this is called the tangled ball of emotions, and this is what you experience in grief, all these different emotions all at one time. And one minute you're laughing, the next minute you're angry, the next minute you're, you're sad, the next minute you're guilty, all these things together. That, friends, is what normal grief is like. No wonder people don't know how to handle it and don't provide a very safe place. And so what does it mean to be able to find a safe place in the midst of that? It means finding people and finding places who are going to allow us to hurt. That sounds a little funny. We usually don't want to hurt. But the reality is grief hurts. And what most people try to do when we're hurting is they want to make us feel better right away. They want us to take our minds off of what we're experiencing. But we're going to see in just a moment that's not what is most helpful. But grief really does hurt. There's another word that we often use along with grief, and that's the word bereavement. Or we say, we say the person who is grieving is the bereaved. Do you see there what the literal meaning of the word bereaved is? It means to be torn apart 
and to have special needs. Isn't that what happens when you're in the midst of grief? Part of you has been torn away when you experience loss. Maybe your hopes or your dreams that you had planned before get torn away from you. No wonder grief hurts. So I say, be kind to yourself. Allow yourself to feel that hurt, but also find safe places where other people will allow yourself to hurt. Let me share something else with you that's really important in all that we're going to be talking about today. We looked at the word bereavement that we often use along with grief. We also use another word, the word mourning. And most of the time we think, oh, grief and mourning, they mean the same thing. And we use those words interchangeably. But friends, it's really important for you to understand these are not interchangeable words. They mean different things, and it's important to understand the difference. Grief is what we experience on the inside when we go through a loss. Okay, It's all those things that we feel from the tangled ball emotions. We feel the, the sadness. We feel the, the guilt. We feel the anger, all those different things. But you know what, friends? It's not enough for us just to grieve a loss. It's not enough just to feel those things. We also need to mourn our losses. Mourning is the outward expression of our grief. How do we let it out? We let it out by crying. We let it out by talking about what we're experiencing. We let it out through rituals, through lighting a candle in somebody's name. Okay, or going to a graveside, or going to a special group meeting. They can all be ways that we mourn and we let it out. But the reason that this is so important is if we don't intentionally let it out, you know what's going to happen? It's going to come out on its own. And whenever it comes out on its own, it's never pretty. When it comes out on its own, it comes out through depression or it comes out through acts of violence, or it comes out through some other physical, medical conditions. I'm convinced that there are a number of cancers and other conditions that are the direct result of grief that has not been mourned. It wants to come out, and if we don't intentionally let it out, then it's going to find its own way out. And so what does it mean to be in a safe place? I said it means that we're with people and that we're at places where they allow us to hurt because we do hurt and we need to express it. Where they allow us to cry. You ever notice what happens when you cry and people come right up and do this? Can you see that on my video? We push tissues into their face. And what are we saying when we do that? Oh, come on, wipe those tears. Come on, I, we want to make you happy again. No, sometimes we just need to cry, but we need a safe place where people allow us to do that. A safe place is a place that will give us permission to feel whatever we feel because our feelings are never wrong. And what we do with them can be right or wrong, but the feelings aren't, and we need to express them. Permission to say whatever we want to say and to do whatever we want to do. Now, let me just qualify that a little bit. That does not mean it's ever okay to harm ourselves or to harm somebody else. Okay? Nor are we saying it's good for you to do something that is illegal or immoral. But besides those, harm ourselves, harm somebody else, something illegal or immoral, we need to find places where we can be real and be ourselves and say and do and feel and cry and hurt and just be however we are in response to and in the midst of the losses that come our way. That's principle number one, find a safe place. Let me go on to principle number two. Principle number two is board the roller coaster and hold on tight. 
Okay, that's kind of a funny one, isn't it? Board the roller coaster and hold on tight. Yeah, and by roller coaster, I mean roller coasters. If you've ever gone to an amusement park, how's this one for a roller coaster? I'm not sure where this is located, but I love the picture. So I'm just wondering, how many of you would go on this roller coaster with me? I love roller coasters. Any of you want to go on with me? Okay, I know we're not being interactive right now, but I would imagine there are some of you who'd say, oh yeah, Don, I'm with you. Let, let's go for that ride. But I would guess the majority are saying, no way. No, thank you. That is not for me. Because if you'd go on a roller coaster like this, one, it would be really scary. Okay, that's a pretty high hill. Not only would it be scary, but some would say, I would get so dizzy. Others would say, I would probably throw up. Oh, that would just make me terribly sick. Oh, I would be so nauseous. Just not a really good experience. Okay. What? Well, how about this one? Would this one be better? All the twists and the turns? Upside down riding? Some of you are saying, no way. Take it away. I don't even want to see it. You know what, friends? The roller coaster is a perfect image for us to use about what it feels like to express our grief. Okay, there are the ups and the downs. The one minute when we're smiling and the next minute when we're angry or laying on the floor crying. Okay, up and down all the time. The twists and the turns, life is totally different once you get this diagnosis. Life is totally different when you experience the loss and your loved one dies. Okay. And it's like the roller coaster. And most of us say, I don't like this feeling at all. But you know what principle number two is? Let me remind you. You get on that roller coaster and just hold on tight and go for the ride of your life. What I'm saying is, rather than trying to avoid all those emotions, express them, let them out, allow yourself to experience them. Remember the tangled ball emotions? All of those emotions. You get on that roller coaster and let the ups and the downs take place. And when the emotions come, embrace those emotions, become a friend to those feelings. I, I, I mean, normally we do just the opposite, don't we? If we put our hand on a hot stove, what do you do? You pull it away. We don't leave it there. If you pinch yourself and say, oh, that hurts, we don't keep pinching. No, we want to avoid the pain. But you remember what we said earlier? The difference between grief and mourning? The best and the most important thing we can do is let out what we're experiencing. It's to express it. And I don't mean that I want you to do that for the rest of your life. But the only way to go through that tunnel, remember we're looking for finding our path through loss, is to be able to let it out in this way. It's to mourn. We're going to talk in a little bit later at another principle what the goal of mourning is. And we're going to learn how to continue to express our pain, but to learn how to live life in the midst of that. Okay? But we don't want to avoid it, which is exactly what most people do. They tell us, oh, you shouldn't feel that way. We need to stop you from feeling upset. We need to stop you from hurting. No, we need to allow that to come out and to experience it until we start to be able to feel better. Uh, eventually, as time goes on, the roller coaster hills aren't going to be as high and they're not going to go as low. It's going to level out a little bit more. But until that time comes, and we'll see the time is different for each of us, befriend those emotions, embrace them, get on the roller coaster and hold on tight. Let's move on to principle number three for the sake of time. Principle number three is tell your story. One of the best, most helpful things we can do when experiencing grief is to talk about it. 
It's to tell our story. And that's why um, we're going to, I want to share with you at the end that we're going to be setting up some grief support groups for the Histio community where you can be with safe people and can talk about your story, where you can talk about your experience, where you can share it. And people are going to support you and listen to you and will respond by saying, not you need to be quiet about this, but rather, yeah, tell me more. What has that been really like? This is a beautiful and wonderful way for us to mourn our losses, to talk about what's going on. What do we usually like to talk about? Well, here are some things that, that some people like to do when they're telling their story. They like to share their memories. Uh, I remember the time when, and just to go on and on and sharing those memories that you have shared together. Some like to talk about their relationship and what the relationship was like. Uh, before the diagnosis, this is what it was like for us. Or before my loved one died, this is the kind of relationship we shared and we could talk about anything. Sometimes in telling our story, we need to share the details. Far more details than a lot of people really want to be able to listen to. But we need to share them. Sometimes we need to go through everything that happened. And that's why we find a safe place where people can, where we can share that. Sometimes we like to talk about the emotions. Okay, going back to that tangled ball of emotions. These are the things I was feeling. This is what I was experiencing. And then this happened. And just talking about it all. Sometimes we like to talk about our fears and our struggles. That's very real, too, in, in this whole story, isn't it? It can be scary. What's the future going to look like? How do I move forward without the loved one here? How do we live life with this diagnosis, all the struggles that are part of it. If we had the opportunity to talk and share and interact together, I would ask you this question, how does it feel when you get to tell your story? I can tell you what most people say. They say, it just feels so wonderful. It's such a release when I get to talk about it, when I get to share it. Oh, I just like talking about it. I like talking about our memories and the relationship. And we just can't get enough of it. And we want to do it over and over again. So what keeps us from telling our story? Most of the time, it's not finding safe people or finding safe places to do so. And so that's why we start by finding those safe places. We board that roller coaster. We let the emotions out. We allow ourselves to be very real with what we're experiencing. And then we continue in those safe places to tell our story and to talk about what our experience has been like and is like. Let's go on to principle number four. Principle number four is learn what is normal in grief? Let me read what I wrote on the screen. The journey through grief can be so radically different from our everyday realities that sometimes it feels more like being picked up and dropped on the surface of the moon than it does a journey through Earth. What is unusual in life is often usual in grief. Because we like to stick our head in the sand like the ostrich instead of talking about grief, I commend you. You're all here. You're talking about it. You're facing it today. But because we live in a world that doesn't do this very much, we don't know what normal grief looks like. Okay, We don't know because nobody talks about the experience. As a result of that, do you know a question that I get asked nearly every day? As I do my grief coaching, as I run grief support groups, as I talk with people who are grieving, I mean, there's barely a day that goes by that I don't know if someone asks this question. The question is, 
am I going crazy? I think something's wrong with me. I must be going nuts. Something's wrong. Uh, I'm having all these terrible reactions. One minute I'm crying, the next minute I'm laughing, then I'm angry. I'm experiencing all these different things I've never experienced before. What's wrong with me? And you know what? 99% of the time, these people who I talk to, they're not going crazy. What they're experiencing is normal grief. But no one ever told them what it was before. I'd like to share with you a whole list of things that are absolutely normal for somebody who's experienced loss. So for somebody who's grieving. But if you're not in the midst of loss and grief, then if you're experiencing these things, you better get some help because they're not normal. Okay, What's normal in grief is often not normal in other times. So let me share some of these with you. Let's go through the list. Unable to motivate yourself to do the things that you need to do. Okay, You just don't feel like doing anything, and sometimes you don't. Unable to concentrate or remember things. People in grief who are losing their keys. They walk into a room and they can't remember why they walked in there. Now, I realize this happens to most of us as we're getting older and we don't concentrate or remember as well, but it's amplified all the more when we're in grief. We just can't concentrate because our loss distracts us and pulls us away. Unable to sleep without medication or maybe sleeping all the time. A change in eating habits, significant weight gain or weight loss being much more irritable than usual, experiencing unpredictable, uncontrollable bouts of crying, fearful of being alone or fearful of being with people, afraid to leave the house or afraid to stay in the house, afraid to sleep in the bed you once slept in, feeling frustration that friends call too much or they don't call enough. They don't invite you out anymore. They seem to be pushing you into socializing before you're ready. Dreaming a lot about the person who died. Or for sometimes it's, what's wrong? I don't dream about that person at all. Wanting to punish something or someone for your pain. Telling and retelling your story over and over and over and over again. Mystical experiences. I thought I heard her call. That was her voice. I know it. I saw him at the foot of my bed. I know somebody was there. So common. Angry that no one seems to understand what's happened to you. Angry that people expect you to get on with your life. Angry that you're not given the time that you need to grieve. We could go on and on, friends. These are all normal, typical things that happen when a person is experiencing loss and is grieving. But we don't talk about it and we think, what's wrong with me? Again, if we had time, I'd. I'd invite you to pick out some of those that spoke to you. And I think what we would hear are numerous stories. And and many people say, I've never shared this with anyone because I was embarrassed to talk about it. And yet I think what you would find, and this is what we'll get to do in the grief support groups, is to be able to say, I'm not alone. Others have experienced the same. That is amazing. There's a picture I'd like to learn with this. I'll give you a moment to take a look at that picture. Do you like my picture? (laughs) It's kind of a strange picture, isn't it? Cows don't usually jump with the dolphins. But you know what? When we are in grief, we often feel a lot like this cow. We feel like we're jumping with the dolphins because everyone else who isn't experienced loss, maybe others who aren't part of the Histio community, look at us and say, what is wrong with you? And we look at them and say, yes, what is wrong with us? I feel like this cow jumping with the dolphins. I'm experiencing these things that other people aren't experiencing. 
That's what's normal in grief. How do we learn what's normal? Read the books, my books, other books that talk about it. Come to the grief group so that you can see what others are experiencing as well. Begin to talk about it and to realize it's not something we have to stick our head in the sand about. This is very real. You know, there's one other part of this learning what's normal in grief. It's to know that grief is not only an emotional reaction, but there are a lot of physical symptoms of grief. I'm going to put up a list of many different physical things that come as a result of grieving. I'll let you read through that list up on the screen. But let me just say, whenever you have physical things that are going on, similar to what Deanna said in the very beginning of this webinar, I always suggest you go see the doctor. Please don't look at it and say, oh, Don says there's no physical problem, it's just part of my grief. Very often it probably is, but please go see a doctor first and allow the doctor to share with you, yeah, go talk some more about your grief. Go get some support and some coaching to help you through that because everything checks out physically. But having said that, you need to understand all these physical symptoms are normal parts of the grieving process. So be aware of it and talk about it with your medical doctor. All this to go along with the principle, if we want to find our path through loss, principle number four is learn what is normal in grief. Let me keep moving. Number five, take as much time as you need. You know, we, we live in a world where everybody wants things done quickly. I like to watch when people go to, they're in a building and they push the button for the elevator to come. And what happens if the elevator doesn't come in 10 seconds? We push the button again, right? Come on, I need it to come. I'm in a hurry. A question people often ask me in grief is, how can I speed up this process? I don't want to feel this pain anymore. I want to get over it. Or if we don't ask it about ourselves, other people ask it, right? Aren't you over it yet? Come on, it's been six months. You need to get over this. Take as much time as you need. There is no specific time zone. There's no specific time limit for how long it's going to take. For some people, they're going to move on and start living life a lot quicker, depending on their circumstances. For others, it's going to be a long time. It's going to be years before they're able to start really living life again. That is okay. There's no set pattern. Take as much time as you need is principle number five. Principle number six, don't let anyone tell you what to do. You know, when we are grieving, a lot of people like to tell us what to do. I'm sure you've experienced that with the loss and in the way that Histio has affected you, okay? Whether it's you, it's whether it's as a friend, whether it's a loved one who's died. People like to come in and say, you know what you need to do? You need to. You know what? It's not helpful when people come and tell us what we need to do, is it? The reality is your grief journey is unique. Okay? Now, no two people go through the mourning process exactly the same. I'm giving you some principles here today that you can apply to your loss, but you need to see which ones really apply to you and what the next step forward for you is. Because I'm not the expert of you, okay? I've worked with a lot of people in grief, but I'm not the expert in you in your experience. You are the expert as what you need to do. You know what happens a lot? We like to compare ourselves to other people and say, you know what? My sister and I both lost our mother. And yet my sister is up and about and going out and doing things. And I'm still sitting in the house and I'm crying. And why are we different? 
Well, it's because grief is different for each of us. Don't compare yourself to other people or don't let other people compare their story to yours and say, this is what worked for me, so this is what you should do. Always listen to their suggestions because maybe it's something you want to apply, but don't let anyone tell you what to do. You decide what you need. Okay. Let's go on to number seven. Principle number seven is discover your new normal. And I use these words very intentionally here, saying about your new normal. And I use them because this is these are words that a lot of people use for us when we're experiencing loss. They say, when are you going to get back to normal? You ever have somebody say that to you? You know, they say, I miss the old you and the way you used to be. You used to be so much fun and you're just not fun anymore. When are you going to get back to normal? And that's why I use these words to say, it's not a matter of getting back to normal. We never get back to the way things were. And that's not always bad, but it's not the same. When we experience loss, when you become part of the Histio community, your life is different. It's changed. And the goal isn't to get back to normal again in the way you were before. The real goal of this whole process is to discover what your new normal is. It's to learn how to live life again. You know what the problem is when we share about our Histio journey or when we share about our grief and our loss journey? Most people don't understand what that means, and they have a wrong picture in their mind as to what it, that is like. You know what most people picture grief to be like? Let me put an actual picture up on the screen. This is their image of grief. It's like someone who has a cold. Okay, do you see this poor guy? He's dropping his tissues, his nose is all red, he's a little bit spacey. How many of you have ever had a cold? Okay, if I could see your hands, I bet every hand is up, right? We've all had a cold and you can feel really miserable when you have a cold. But what happens a week or 10 days after you first got your cold? You get better again, right? And you're back to normal. So people look at you and say, okay, yeah, I realize your histio connection here. I realize that you've experienced loss and you're grieving, but but I know what it's like to have a cold. It's been six months. Aren't you over it by now? When are you going to get back to normal again? But you see, this is a wrong picture for what it's like to be grieving. May I share with you a more accurate picture of what grief is like? Remember when we talk about the word bereaved? Bereaved said, a part of you is torn off, that a part of you is missing. This is a picture of my father. My father had his leg amputated as a result of his diabetes. And, you know, my dad went into the surgery with a really positive attitude. We talked about the fact that he was going to be fit for a prosthetic device that with his prosthesis, he was going to be able to, to learn how to walk again and to go through therapy. And we were talking about the things he was going to do again after his surgery and after he'd learned to walk. But you know what would have been foolish? To say, Dad, when are you going to get back to normal? What do you mean back to normal? There's never a day that's going to go by that he doesn't realize his leg is missing. He used to be in construction and climb scaffolding and, and used to run and do all kinds of things. He was not going to be able to do that again. It's foolish to say we want you to get back to normal. No, the goal after dad's surgery was to learn how to live life again with one leg. Learn what the new normal is like. Remember I said we were going to share what the goal of being in grief is? The goal of being in grief is learning how to live life again 
even with the loss that you've experienced. It's how to live life again fully, even with the loss you're still experiencing as a Histio warrior, as a friend or family member. Yes, or as one who's had your loved one die. But it's saying, how do we experience this new type of normal? That's the goal. That's the picture which helps us to see what grief and loss is really all about. What do we mean by discovering you, your new normal? Well, there are a lot of things. Let me give you a couple. One is identifying your new identity. Often we identify ourselves with other people. You know, I'm Russ's son. I'm Sue's husband. I'm Jane's father. What happens when one of those individuals is gone? What happens when there's a change within your status? Okay, Part of the new normal is figuring out who am I now? How do I describe myself? What is my new identity? A new relationship with your loved one. Okay, um, do you still have a relationship with your loved one after they die? Absolutely you do, but it's different. Rather than having a relationship based on physical presence, it's based on memory. Okay, that's part of the new normal is learning how to adjust to that. Probably a new group of friends is another part of the new normal. Okay, if you hung around with a lot of like-minded people, if you hung around um, with other children and then your child dies, are you still going to hang around with those same other children? Maybe not. Maybe you're finding a new group of friends. Okay, so it's who are you going to spend time with becomes part of the new normal. A new sense of purpose. If you spend a lot of time as a caregiver for somebody else and then they die, not only did you lose your loved one, but you lost your job. And you're probably going to ask questions like, what is my purpose now? Why do I need to get out of bed in the morning? Why am I even here? That's all part of discovering your new normal. It's part of that finding your path through loss. I'll throw a fifth one in here. There's often a renewed relationship with the divine, whatever that means to you. For some, they're drawn even closer to the divine. For some, there's a barrier. There's a lot of anger and saying, no, I want nothing to do with spiritual things. But just to realize even that change is part of discovering the new normal. Let me go on to principle number eight, final principle. Celebrate your growth. You know, walking the journey of grief is life-changing. Nobody chooses to experience it. You know, no one says, oh, I'm so glad I could go through this so I can grow. No, that's not what I'm saying. It's unwanted. It's unplanned. Yet even with that reality, for many people, the journey of grief, of loss, is an incredibly wonderful growing experience. Okay? And growth comes in, in many different forms. Okay, for some, it's a new sensitivity toward life. For some, it's appreciating every day. It's appreciating the relationships you have. Maybe it's learning how to be more sensitive to others in difficult times and how to provide a safe place for them. All that to say is just realize often there's growth that takes place. And that's very real. And we want to be aware of that and celebrate that as well. But let me say something really important here, and I'm going to finish up so we have some time for questions and answers. Be careful not to rush these last two principles. Remember them? Discover your new normal and celebrate your growth. Often we want to rush to these and say, come on, let's figure out the new normal. Let's just talk about the growth that's going to happen. You can only get to these last two principles after you have found safe places where you've boarded that roller coaster and let your emotions out, no matter how long that takes. And that might take years, even before you can start leveling off a little bit. It never goes away. It never totally ends. Okay. Grief doesn't. Grief just continues on. But we learn how to live life in the midst of it. Remember? 
You don't want to go up to somebody else in the midst of their initial stages of loss and their diagnosis and their grief and say, oh, you're going to grow so much through this. You might get punched in the face if you say that. Don't rush these last two principles, but know that they are real and know that they are part of the path through loss. So these are the eight principles. Let me put them up here. Find a safe place. Board that roller coaster and hold on tight. Tell your story. Learn what is normal in grief. Take as much time as you need. Don't let anyone tell you what to do. Discover your new normal and celebrate your growth. They're the principles that are going to help you in the beginning of the process of finding your path through loss. I mentioned earlier that we don't want to just share the principles here and say, oh, look, now, now it's done. Now you know what to do. We want to provide a safe place where you can actually practice these principles, where you can live them out. I think Deanna's going to talk about this a little bit more, but we're going to try out a monthly grief support call right on Zoom, okay, like we're doing here, but where we can see each other, where we can talk, and where we can interact together. We're going to start it for three months on the first Monday evening of each month for just about an hour or so. And what this is going to be is a really safe place where you can come, where you can share, where you can talk. And if you don't want to talk, you can just sit and listen. That's okay too. But it's a place where people are going to encourage you. We're going to realize that we're not alone and that there are others experiencing similar journeys. It's not going to be a teaching time. It's going to be a sharing and a support time together. Okay, so Deanna will share a little bit more about that, I believe. I want to stop at that point so we have time for the questions and answer. Let me just say, if I can be of help and support, you're welcome to reach out to me as well. This is my contact information. Love to be able to walk the journey with you some more. Or if you call the Histio office, Deanna or, or the others can get in touch with me as well and put us together in touch if that's going to be a help for you. Diana, can I turn this back to you? Thank you so much, Don, for this really um, encouraging, inspiring, and supportive conversation. So many things that we don't, uh, I think, get to talk about. And even for myself, having been through grief and been through a diagnosis and also working with our community, I know these really resonated with me. Um, we did have one question come in, and I would encourage everyone share thoughts, um, questions, anything that you'd like to bring forward. So uh, this question is asking, with how busy life is, working, taking care of family, life goes on. It feels like I can't pause long enough to really feel as though I've had time to process, to heal, or to grow. Tiny moments here and there don't feel like enough for me. Any suggestions? What a great question that is. Yeah, that's reality, isn't it? Life is just so busy. Um, but I love that you shared that you have those tiny moments. And my encouragement is just find ways to add a little more of those moments onto it. Uh, we still have to live life. We still have to do other things. But it's really important to carve out that time, whether it's when we're driving or when we're in the shower, or some place where you can just add in some time to allow yourself to be real and to feel and to experience and to mourn. Or if you can even set aside an hour to attend a grief support group and say, that's going to be my space where I can be real and let it out. And if you cry through the whole thing, that's okay too. But it's just making some much needed time wherever you can to be able to continue this process. Thank you. Another question that came in is, do you have any ideas for the best way or ways to handle different types of grief at the same time? Just use these same principles for all of them. 
and that's fine. You don't have to separate them. Uh, multiple losses are, are really common. So it's very common within the histio community, I, I would understand. But that is very typical. You know, and when we experience a loss, it almost always stirs up other losses from the past. So don't be surprised if it's not just multiple current losses, but there are all these past losses that's, that start springing up and that you're experiencing. Just continue to let them out simultaneously. Mourn. Talk about it. Find those safe places and cry or however you express those feelings. So another question is regarding um, how to appropriately channel pain and anger. So um, some of the sometimes we feel frustration with physicians or people along the way of our journey who, um, you know, when we don't have answers, especially being in the rare disease community, and where or how can you best channel this pain and anger um, that when you're feeling that way toward a particular maybe individual or part of the whole process. Yeah. And the anger is such a normal part, part of this process. We call these the explosive emotions, but that's not a negative term. It's just, that's how they appear because we get loud and, and there's just a lot of emotion that's behind them. And so what we need to do is let those feelings out. Once we realize the anger is a normal part of it, is to find safe ways to let it out. We don't want to go to the other person and express it toward them, okay? So we want to find like a grief support group or we want to find safe people and say, this is what I'm experiencing. And then find, learn some healthy ways to be able to maybe address those other individuals who are involved that aren't so explosive. But I think the big part is realizing the anger is normal. Don't think something's wrong with you because you're feeling it. It's part of the mourning process. Thank you. And what are your best few tips for being empathetic and supportive of people who are living in grief? Yeah. All these principles that we talked about are of, of how to coach yourself through this path of loss, these principles. In other courses that I teach, we turn them around to be able to train people to be grief coaches, to be supportive of others. So it's using these same principles. Be a safe person for that individual. Don't try to tell them what to do. They don't need your answers. The best thing you can say is, what is it like for you? What are you really feeling? I would love to hear what this is like. And then truly listen. Don't run away from them, but be present with them. Walk the journey with them and allow them to take as much time as they need to go through it. If you do these things, you're going to be the most amazing friend or relative to those who are grieving, because that's what almost everyone in grief is looking for, somebody to be present and walk the journey with them. Great question. Thank you for asking that. Thank you. I really like how you're able to use the same principles for yourself and for others. I think that's really wonderful to know um, that it's it's that it's sort of flexible and you can apply that. So it's it's easier to keep track of them. Um, really love the principles. I think we have time for one more question, and it has to do with forgiving oneself. How do you do that? How do you go about finding ways to have self-forgiveness and especially when you're managing extreme sorrow? Yeah, that's great. Can I just comment first about, I saw on the chat, sure. um, somebody named Paula just mentioned, said, um, thank you. I cried a lot during the talk. I just, I love that. Okay. Not because I want you to be sad and crying, but because that's a sign of facing it. That's a sign of mourning, of letting this out. So that was beautiful. Thank you, Paula. Um, how do we forgive ourselves? Yeah, that's an ongoing process. It's not a once and done process of, oh, I just, I'll let go. But it's a matter of continuing to process. Nobody else can tell us, oh, you shouldn't feel that way. You just do feel that way. So let it out, express it, find safe people you can talk about it with, and be able to work through until, until you can figure out on your own that, yeah, I probably made some mistakes, but I really did the best I can. And I really do 
loved these individuals and wanted to be the best help and support. And whether you've made mistakes along the way or not, you're human and your intention was really to do what was best. I'm not telling you that. You just need to process that and figure that out on your own. But take as long as it takes to be able to talk it through and to work out your own sense of, of how you can move forward and start living life again in the midst of the difficult, hard things that you've experienced. Thank you so much, Don. And um, I know we could spend all day with you. It's really just so wonderful to have an opportunity to be vulnerable, to ask these questions, and to have these conversations. As you mentioned in your talk, we don't often think to talk about grief. And um, oftentimes, talking about it just in and of itself can be such a good release. So I want to thank you so much on behalf of the association and the Histia community for sharing your experience and your principles. Um, it's been wonderful to learn from you, and we are really excited to have the monthly support calls. I did put the information in the chat as well to Don's website, coaching at endoflife.com, and Don's email address, as he shared on the screen as well. And then there is a link for our peer support chats. If you'd like to take a look at that page and I'll, I'll now also pop in the direct link to register for the monthly support calls. Please share this with friends and family as well who um, you think may benefit. We'd love to have you there and um, to continue to grow these. Um, there are some additional resources up on the screen if you're interested in connecting more with the association. And um, if, encourage you to stay on after we end today's call. There'll be a feedback survey. And if you'd like Don or the association to be in touch with you following the, uh, this talk, you can express interest in that survey. And um, we can share your information with Don as well or you can reach out to him directly if you'd prefer. Um, Don, if there's anything else that you'd like to share uh, with everyone today? No, it's just such a privilege to be here, and I'd love to be able to walk this journey with you in whatever way I can best do so as well. So thank you for allowing me to be here today. Thank you so much. We really in enjoyed uh, the conversation and look forward to working more with you in the future. So thank you and thank you all for spending some time with us today, taking some time for yourself um, and to, to create some space in your journey to focus on, on grief and um, learning these principles.